what I'm going to write, the, I'll type up the transcription of the interview and then we'll give, you, give it to you for oh, you know, a review. Um, but uh, going back to some of these questions. Do you remember, um, no, the question is, describe what it was like the day your service ended. Do you remember that? The day our service ended, that I came home? Yeah, the, your particular service ended. I know you talked about VE Day in, uh, in well, Paris, but it was I'll like... Well, I'll tell you, I am... Um, let me see. We went, we went home from Germany. Uh, I can't remember the name of the town, but up in northern Germany, we we went home from there. Okay. Did you fly home or did you worry on it? No, I took a ship home. Okay. And it was it was February. It was terrible famine. Then everybody on the ship was sick at one time or another because the ship was bouncing all over. This is February 1946. Six. Okay. And um, before I went home, I thought you know, I've been to Los Angeles and San Francisco and Boston and Philadelphia and Washington. But I've never been to New York. The one city I've ever been to, I've been to London, to Paris, to Berlin, but never New York. So I thought, gee, I'd like to go for New York for a couple of days. So I went into the, to the uh, sergeant, who uh, this clerk in, in the company, and I told him, uh, sergeant, I said, my family has moved to New York, so I'd like to get discharged in New York. So he says, okay, so he put it down. So when I took the boat home, and they saw where I lived. They shipped me out to Fort Dix, which was in New Jersey, okay. because I, I lived in New York. So my family was still in Chicago. Right. But I was told that they would, since my family wasn't in New York, and I told them, I said, they, they must have made a mistake, because I, I said, my family's always been in Chicago. Uh -huh. They says, well, in that case, we got to give you per diem. They have to pay us by the day. Okay. So I said, well, I said, I'll be here for about a week. So it says, well, we'll pay you so much per day. To stay in New York? And yeah, to stay in New York. Okay. So uh, I went back to Fort Dix at night time, but then, I, but then I was paid so much per day, and I made a few hundred dollars doing that. Mm -hmm. And um, I, it was, There was two musicians, musicians, a Charlie Parker and a Dizzy Gillespie. Okay. You ever heard of either? Yeah, I've heard of them. And Dizzy Gillespie created some new kind of music called bebop, and I never liked it, but I still wanted, I still wanted to hear about it. And he and Charlie Parker, he was a saxophone player, happened to be in New York while I was there, so I went down to 52nd Street where all the jazz places were. And I went to see Charlie Parker and um, Dizzy Gillespie. Really? And I did the second. And while I was in the, uh, New York, I called my folks up, and my dad said, "You know," he says, "Your mother's." He says, "Your mother's birthday is a couple of days from now." He says, "Can you come home?" And I says, "Absolutely, I'll come home." So I I left after a couple of days, but they paid me, they paid me for going home to to Chicago. Uh -huh. So, and I always laughed at that I was able to do something like that, because while I was in New York, I saw a musical called Oklahoma. Uh -huh. That was the first uh, Roger Hammerstein, uh, uh, Rogers and Hammerstein uh, musical. Okay. I saw a play. So I can't remember the name of the play. I saw a very famous play. And um, and I went to about three or four other jazz places, and I saw some jazz artists while I was there in New York. Sounds like you had a fantastic time. Huh? You had a fantastic time. Well, yeah. I had a good time. Yeah. Um, how long did it take you to get from when you boarded? About seven days. Seven days to, to, from the boat when you were in Germany to yeah, so we okay. got home. Was it difficult on the on the on the ship? Was was this the the story you told me on the way back when they did yeah. a, you did a newsletter on the way back? And no, that was going. That was going. Okay, That's so what was it like coming uh, coming back? Going back, I don't know. Nothing special. People were just sick because it was February, and it was a small ship. Okay. And. Uh, was it, I would imagine that it was, was the water pretty choppy. I mean, was it? Oh, it was terrible. Yeah. It was terrible. 
and just about everybody got sick. And I, I remember I, I was goofing around once, and they put me in KP. And, uh, that's kitchen. That's kitchen. Uh, yeah, kitchen police. Okay. Oh, that's what KP. And um, and I, I went in, went in, and uh, and I could smell the, the chickens. And because the ship was bouncing back and forth, I suddenly, I suddenly felt very funny. Yeah. And I just got out of the kitchen. I said, I can't take this. And I went back out. And I went out to the outside of the ship. Sure. And that was the closest I got to being sick. But everybody else on the ship, it was just terrible how they were. I bet, yeah. Um, it, it takes a while even yeah. to get your sea legs. And oh, then, yeah. It was yeah. just terrible. Huh. Were you, um, so, uh, did you have, what did you have when you were, was it, you just had maybe a, a, a bag of your clothes? A barracks bag. Barracks bag? Yeah. Okay. It was a canvas bag and you just threw everything in it. How big was that? Was it like? Well, it was a bag that would stand, would stand as high as you could stand as, on its bottom. It stand about this high and put this much around. Okay. Okay. Would you, and you just kind of lug it over your shoulder? Yeah. No. Yeah. Okay. Um. And then basically everyone was, uh, all the soldiers were, were allowed to have one canvas bag, or did you, did people yeah, have more than one? Sorry, I had just one. Okay. Um, I wasn't sure, because you talked about having like a, you had purchased a, a radio. Um, oh, yeah. Some of them, did I, you, left, I left it there. Oh, I did you leave it? I didn't take it home. Okay. Um, so when you got to, I know you got, you got back to, you went to New York, yeah. and you got back to, uh, to Chicago in, in time for your, your mom's birthday? Is that yeah, yeah. yeah. How was that when you, when they, you, you, the first time you'd seen your parents in quite some time, and yeah. what was that welcome? Yeah, it was about a year and a half. And they were waiting for me on, on 63rd Street. There was, the elevator had a, a, had a station there. Okay. And the Illinois Central train came in uh, to that elevator station, and my, my brother-in-law, who was, uh, got out before me because he went in before me, my sister, my dad, and my mom were there. And they took me to a local restaurant for a, a bite to eat. Really? And while I was there, there was a couple of fellows I grew up with, and one of the fellows came over to say hello to me. And he was limping badly, and he, he almost got his leg knocked off. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what it was. This is the way it was. People were injured and hurt and so forth. And, um, and this fellow became a, a very successful one. He was an accountant, became a very successful businessman, went to Northwestern. But at the time that I saw him, he was really beat up pretty badly. Sure. It was, so it's a pretty bittersweet homecoming then, I mean, seeing, you know. Yeah, yeah. And I, I was so excited to be at home. It was, right. it was just terrific. With, um, was it difficult to adjust then? I mean, you'd been in a very... Yeah, know, I think so. Okay. I well, was... Um, yeah, I was. I always had a lot of people around me in the army and so forth. But even in the army, when in 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 December before I came home, I was kind of lonely. I was listening to this music that that I heard all the time at home. Right. And I felt lonely. And I I felt it was time to go home. Mm -hmm. And then uh, when I got home, you know, there were some of them, some of. Our friends had, had come home when I did, and some had not come home yet. And, and I really didn't know a lot of people when I first got home. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the boys and girls that I grew up with, they, they just weren't around at that right. time. Right. And the girls, the, we, I was 18 when we went in. By the time I was 21, the girls were 21, I mean, in our class. And, you know, that's the time they got married. And a lot of the girls, they were, which surprised me, you know, they were engaged, they were married, and uh, yeah, I, mean, I suppose even some of the fellows were though. Uh, most of them had come back from service; they weren't, they weren't that way. Yeah, but a lot of the girls were married. The boys that first came back, mm -hmm. and the girls, you know, as I said, even my sister, my sister was 22, and uh, she wouldn't have had a chance to get married had she not got married during the war. Right. And then she wouldn't have been married until she was 25 or 26. Mm -hmm. So for the girls, it was pretty tough. Well, yeah, I mean, that distance, uh, you know, yeah. letters were so important. And oh, sure. Not yeah. knowing you know, really yeah. what was happening on the other side. And initially, you know, when you first start writing letters, I would write maybe 20, 25 letters. It sounds crazy, but you would do it. Yeah. 
I mean, gradually they would dwindle. You'd get an answer for some of them, you wouldn't get an answer from others. Mm -hmm. So the next time I wrote 15, next time I wrote maybe 8, and then I got down to 3 or 4, and that's about <laughs> what I would write. But you wrote your family also, and I had a fairly large family. Sure. And, you know, my aunts would, one of my aunts, I remember at Christmas time, sent me, sent me a, a, a Christmas pudding. And I was, at the time I was in the Air Cadet program and living in a dormitory. And we used to have, uh, in, and we had, um, in, a, in our breakfast in the morning, we used to have bottles of cream on the table. Uh -huh. And we, my, <laughs> my aunt sent me this Christmas pudding. And I says, geez, I said, you can't eat pudding without getting some cream. So when there was nobody around, I ran, went into the kitchen, and I opened up the, the, the refrigerator, and there was all these uh, um, bowls of, of cream. And I put them in a, a bowl, and I took them all over, and the following morning, everybody had to drink their coffee black. <laughs> <laughs> we thought we had cream for our Christmas pudding. Well, that's nice. That's, uh, you know, <laughs> some things need to be done. So. Um, well, so, you know, the, uh, uh, what, were your parents, I mean, they wrote you letters, I'm sure they were very concerned oh, sure. about, um, okay. especially since, you, as you said, there were, you know, sections that were basically blacked out of the letters, so that might have caused more worry. Oh, yeah. Know, since right. they didn't know exactly right. what was going right. on. People seem to adjust to it pretty well. You know, they adjusted pretty well because just about everybody was going there. There were very few people you didn't, whose family didn't send somebody uh, into the service. Right. And um, yeah, um, I, I knew very few fellows that didn't go on service. Very, very few. Did you talk? I know you didn't join any uh, veterans. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But the, the reason I didn't join is because what I understood is the, the wealthy people were taking over these outfits. Okay. And uh, in the American Legion, which was the biggest one of all, the people who were making an awful lot of money right after the war were the real estate people, because people came, they back, came back from the service, so they were building a lot of small homes mm -hmm. in, uh, in Chicago mm -hmm. and all over the country. Right. And these real estate people sort of took over the American Legion, and uh, what they were doing was selling homes to the, the, to right. the uh, people my age that were or people a little bit older just got married. So they saw an opportunity, you know, all these, yeah, these guys so together at one place right, and they could... Right, so, so they, they, they were taking, uh, they were exploiting the Legion, and I didn't like that one bit. Yeah. And then they had, as, and as I told you, they had, they, somebody called me up who was Jewish and said, we're at the Jewish veterans thing, like, why don't you come over, Buster? And I said, hey, that's terrific. I said, I'll meet a lot of the people that I knew before the war. Yeah. So I went there. And there were a bunch of guys that were there, and they were passing around a petition to, to start this association. And I said, boy, this is terrific. So I got the petition, and I said, hey, you signed this. So they signed it. So then I took it, and I handed it to the next guy, and I wouldn't sign it. Because I felt that, um, as I think I told you, yeah. uh, I was in service for three years, and we didn't say we were one religion or another religion, so why should we do it after the war? Right. You know. So I, I didn't join. There was an author called the American Veterans Group, and they were very idealistic people. And uh, they were the one group that I, I said I was going to join, but I never did. Why didn't you join them? I, uh, I'd, so I never joined any of veterans group. I just didn't, didn't think it was the right idea. Yeah. But the American Veterans was different. They were, they were a bunch of uh, young people, and uh, they were interested, like in the GI Bill, making sure that of the fellows who were uh, going to college were able to get the GI Bill and get their money and so forth. Right. Well, so, you know, you, you talked. Well, there was so the, there was a Jewish, um, you know, veterans group. There was a Catholic yeah. uh, veterans group. I wonder if any of those groups, even though they were joined together, it, or if they, you know, talk communicated with each other. If one would speak at the other, oh, you know, oh, sure. the other group would oh, speak sure. at another. Yeah, there was nothing discriminatory about it. Yeah. But it was just that. Uh, well, it's just like, you know, going to church. You belong to the church group, and you just join the church group. Sure, okay. But there, there was nothing, uh, there was no other reason other than just the fact 
that the fellows wanted to get with the people that they grew up with. Yeah, sure. You know. Well, it's, you know, I mean, no, it's, there were these established veterans groups, and yeah. depending on what your interest was, right. you there might was have joined a, them. There's the disabled veterans group, and if you were disabled, you would quite often, quite likely join that. Right. Because you, you would need help. Yeah, sure. And it was important that you join them. How was the, did you know anyone who was disabled up to, you mentioned the, the gentleman who became a, a, an accountant? Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. He, he obviously yeah. wasn't on disability, but uh, no. for those who, who were so um, disabled, you know, um, yeah. uh, injured from the war, um, yeah. how was the, uh, do, you, do you know how the how much care they received from the government, how, how much they might have been helped at the time after the war? No, because fortunately I wasn't hurt. And I really was not around people who were dis disabled. But even down at school, I, I don't remember how the any uh, of the fellows on the channel that were injured. It was pretty hard, I guess, you know, if you were disabled and you came home, yeah. it's not likely you're going to go away to school. You might go in Chicago. Sure. That's about it. Yeah. Um, let's see. Does, there's a question here. Do you have any sure. photographs, a diary, or other memorabilia from your days in the service? Or anything that, that you recall? I know it was a long time ago. Anything that you have left over? Uh, yeah, I have. I have I had a picture, picture, picture of a, a fellow. But he was, a, I met him when he was a civilian. And we were, um, my wife went, and I went out of town, and there was a group of uh, people our age, and uh, and I and we were friendly with these people for about a week. There. And uh, I asked him before I, before I left, I says, "Do you have a picture?" And he gave a picture of himself as a soldier. Maybe step it up on my wall. That's about the only picture. I uh, I've, yeah, I have a friend to this day. <clears throat> we were friends since we were 10 years old. And, and matter of fact, I'm going to see him. I don't see him much. I'm going to see him this Friday. Oh, great. And, um, and I have a picture of, uh, up on my wall, I've got loads of pictures of my family and kids and all the grandkids and all. Sure. And I've got a picture of him. He was, he got an award from Northwestern. <coughs> and he became a, uh, a correspondent for, um, for Walter Cronkite. Did you ever hear Walter Cronkite? Yeah, you, you talked to briefly oh, yeah. about him last time. Yeah. But, uh, and he, um, he lives in New York, and he's he, he comes in once a year to Chicago. So we we'll go off for dinner with my fam with my wife, and my daughter, and uh, I have his picture of out there. That's great. <coughs> in uniform, in <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> not in uniform, but he he got awarded Northwestern for for um, I don't know for for being very scholarly. He he. He went, he was working on a newspaper in Chicago, the Herald American, which was a Hearst newspaper. Okay. <coughs> and then in the evening he went to night school. It took him about seven years to graduate. And then he went out and got a, a master's degree at night time. Mm -hmm. And then while he was in uh, Chicago, he uh, saw an advertisement, I guess, that Walter uh, Cronkite was looking for somebody. So he, he went to New York, and he became the proofreader for all the copy on, on television. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and, uh, and then he, Northwestern gave him an award for, for doing so well in college and doing it at nighttime, you know. Yeah. And his family, his family needed help, so he, was, he, had, oh, he worked in the daytime so he could contribute to the family. This, you know, that working around the clock, I know uh, you did that when you, you, you started the newspaper. Oh, yeah. The, the, the oh. Bugle and oh, my gosh. Yeah. That was, um, that was a, that was a seven-day-a-week job, and I often worked uh, from, from morning until 10, 11 o'clock. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Was it difficult, I mean, to figure out, I know there was a business reason, you know, that obviously there yeah. was, you, you saw an opportunity there, yeah. but um, was it difficult to, to, uh, Focus what your uh, your interest was going to be. You know, reporting on. on I had no on idea when I started. I just used to go to village board meetings. I think I told the board, zoning board, right. school, school board, sure. park board. Well, those are all the, the important. You know, right, right. talking about community news. And then, 
And then and I began writing a column, a personal column. And then the first week I, I wrote a column that some famous uh, journalists had written about being in the newspaper business. And I just told them, you know, well, we're going to uh, have a newspaper delivered to every home. We had about 9,000 homes in. And um, you know, and I gave them the reasons why we're, st we're starting a paper. Right. And I thought it was important for the community to have a newspaper. Sure. And that was the first column. And then a couple of weeks later, I wrote another column. Then I began writing one every week. And the column was was very good. I was. Uh, I wrote about what I saw. If, if uh, any of the trustees or the, or the mayor or the police chief did, did something that I didn't think he should have done, I put it right in that column and I mentioned his name and all. Yeah. And the people loved it because they liked to hear about sure. things like that. Right. And they didn't love it. And they, and they, they You mean the elected officials? Yeah. That, yeah. They, did that, that pushback, I wonder, um, you yeah. know, it must have continued, you know, throughout, because you sold the paper what, in the late eight, 1980s? Did yeah, in the 90s. But oh, I, oh, oh. I think it was, uh, I think it was 2003. I, I oh, oh, really? But my, my son was in the business. Oh, business. I see. Okay, so, yeah. okay, so he took it over and, uh, and he, he, he's a journalist overseas now. Oh, is he really? Where, yeah. where is he working? He, <laughs> He works in the Middle East or the Far East. Wow. And he, um, what, what he does is he, is he, he uh, hires people. He hires them mostly from India because they, they can speak English. And they would um, write things for a computer. Okay. And they would have computer news um, in the computer that went all over the, the Middle East and the Far East. Really? Okay. And um, the people from India um, worked at a nominal salary. And he's, he's got about, uh, well, he's got about seven or eight countries that, are, that uh, buy the newspaper from him. Okay. And what he does, he's, he, sells, he sells the paper to, uh, to, to somebody uh, in the country. And then the country, either the country itself would run the newspaper, would own the paper. Okay. And uh, for the most part, uh, they had no idea how to, how to create a paper or so forth. Mm -hmm. And he's been over for about 10 years now. So he learned a lot, I mean, about the newspaper business. Oh, yeah. it, I know it's changed over the years, but he learned a lot from, you know, being at, at, at the Bugle. And oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And um, the one thing, quite, quite honestly, uh, I, 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 I did a pretty good job. Um, there's 700 newspapers. I'm going to be bragging now, so watch out. Maybe you don't even write it down. Um, I, um, I wrote about the gambling in the community for, as I told you, for yeah, 24 years. Yeah, you talked about a little bit about and that. I, did I tell you that the fellow named Joey Aiello? No, we didn't. Uh, um, there was a fellow, Al Capone was, was the number one criminal in the United States back in the 30s and the 40s. Okay. And I happened to, not too long ago, a few years ago, I didn't even know who it was. There was a guy named Joey Aiello that was his right-hand man. And uh, when he needed somebody to uh, be pressured in some way, Joey Aiello would be the one to kill him. And uh, so anyways, when I was uh, doing this, I told you, uh, we were supported a group of uh, Men that didn't have any political background, right. all went to college, and um, and they won the election because of us. There's no doubt about it. Because the mayor, the fellow who was mayor for 40 years to this day, every time he sees me, he says, "Here's the guy that made me mayor." Well, oh, big deal. But but the, the paper endorsed him, mm -hmm. and endorsed the, all the trustees that ran on his ticket. Okay. And there were 21 people that ran, and his four or five were elected by a tremendous majority because the people read the paper right. and, and we were the only paper that endorsed it. There were four newspapers. We were the only one that endorsed them. Subsequently, uh, the Illinois Press Association asked you to uh, send in uh, examples of the work you do. Right. And uh, we, we sent about the, went in and told them that about the, <laughs> this, there was somebody who, uh, as we were going up to uh, the village board meeting to, to uh, the night that they, 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 that they 
made sure that there wouldn't be any gambling in the village of Niles as I walked up to the door and to go up the steps to the uh, oh, to where the meeting was taking place, a fellow stopped me. Did I tell you this? No. But a fellow stopped me and uh, he says, is your name Bud? And I says, no. And I walked up the steps and there was a captain, a police captain up there and I said, Homer, I says, go back down and see who that guy is. Yeah. So he went back down and he told me, he says, said his name was Joey Aiello. A year later, he was in a federal prison for killing somebody. Oh my gosh. So, uh, so I wrote about all this. Yeah. And I sent it down to the Illinois Press Association, and we got the highest award. Now, there's 700 newspapers, but they're not all community papers, but maybe 500 of them are. Yeah. We got the highest community service award. Do you remember when that was? Like, what year that was? Yeah, in 1960. Let's see. These fellows were elected in 61. So probably it used to be 61, 62. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to. Hear and that we can, and that helped us get advertising in the community. Sure. And uh, but you well, know, well, that was about it. You had, you know, all these community newspapers. You know, yeah. you, people coming back and they're 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 building careers. They're you know, they have families. Right. And they're getting more involved in 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 uh, local government. Yep. Yeah. Um, uh, so, did you have people kind of pulling on your arms and, hey, do a story about this, hey, do a story about this, or you know, let people whisper in your ear, hey, something's going on here no. in this section? No. But we used to we would go into the uh, police department every week and you'd go through the police reports. Okay. And it was incredible what we used to read about people we knew. Yeah. You know, things that happened at home or something. You know, sure. The husband beats up his wife. Yeah. He's a terrific guy outside, but you don't, don't know what he's like on the inside. Right. So we just we got an awful lot of information, police reports. Yeah. That's, that's and the reason there were so many newspapers is because there's so many suburbs out here. Mm -hmm. But in order for the big papers really to exist, they had to get an awful lot of advertising, and they had, you know, they might have had 50, 75 people working for them. Yeah. And. Um, and to have this, they had to have several communities that their paper would be in. They, they couldn't do it just on one part with, with uh, one town. Right. Well, and, and we just concentrated. We had four, three or four towns, but we concentrated on nine. So right. one, that was the one town that didn't have very good news from the other papers. Well, they're so important, I mean, to, to look at the... What, what day would you get? You were once a week? It was a Thursday. Thursday? 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 Every Thursday. Okay. And then I know you, you started out with was it one page and then did you go to four, we started out with tabloid okay. four or eight pages oh really ta yeah. okay okay sorry four eight pages and, and we finished with, with about forty that's about all forty pages okay yeah. and um, we uh, started with uh, well I, I, I worked for myself down in the basement when I started yeah and um, when we got there when we finally saw the paper we had fifteen to twenty people working with yeah. Some part time, it's not it's, it's not that big a deal. But some are part time. You know, we had a truck driver. We had two classified girls. We had um, five people in the layout department, and we had um, the display advertising department. We had three or four people. Yeah. Okay. So, so we had a pretty good group. Yeah, that's a. I mean, but still, starting from, from just you, you know, working oh, yeah. you know, yeah. really long hours. Yeah. You know. and, I, and I was lucky, too, because I really didn't know much what I was doing. And, and as I look back on it, I said, I really should have gone work for a paper for a while. I, before I got married, um, I had a hard time finding a job. I went on to different advertising agencies looking for a job. Mm -hmm. And I really wasn't interested in advertising, but I just wanted to get in some kind of business, publishing business. Right. And um, the city, city News Bureau in Chicago is, is a major news bureau. Mm -hmm. And I went there and they told me, uh, it'll be four months, but it says you can wait four months, um, you, you can have a job. And I, um, I says, I can, I'm getting married. Mm -hmm. So I'm getting married and that's when I went my wife's business. And uh, it was too bad because I could have used that background. Yeah. Because really, um, you know, it takes people to run a, run a business, any kind of a business. Well, and, it run, and it takes people to do good editorial work. Mm -hmm. And it, 
And I mean, it's a lot of people to do advertising too. Well, obviously, you know, you, you, uh, you know, the, the, just seeing from the successes that you had, and then the, yeah. the, the amount of the readers that grew, and the, the staff that grew, and the, right. the pages, right. you know, you you were obviously doing something right, you know. Right. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, as I was saying, that focus on those those zoning board meetings or the, the, the yeah. school board meetings, you know, those are the things that people oh, really sure. Sure. care about. Um, sure. And if something's going down on the, on the next block, you know, you had a police report in the paper, too. Yeah. And, you, and, and we, we concentrated on that because we don't, people love to read that stuff, you know. It's, but there were a couple of things that I wouldn't do, though. If, if there was somebody that got caught for, if, if, if they were speeding, and got caught, and especially if they were drinking or something. Mm -hmm. I don't think I put it in the paper because I, I didn't want anybody that was drunk. I, I didn't want to write that in the paper. Okay. And I had their kids read that. Yeah. And, I, and, I was, and surprisingly, I was not restrictive. I, I wanted, I really wanted to, as much inner news as possible. You say and, 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 and some of the other papers would if it was drunk and driving, that made the name the, the, the person. But I wouldn't do that. I just didn't want to. I was a little soft that way. But but I mean, from what I wrote about, you know, the people probably thought that the guys that were working in the village hall were a bunch of crooks because I was telling them. I think I gave you the example where they I don't know, when they took a bid, they take a bid, yeah. one guy would would open it up. Right, right. And. Uh, and I mentioned the, the trustee that did that, mm -hmm. but with the, with some, something like get speeding or drunk and driving or something, I hesitated doing it. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, you know, in some ways you, you got to draw the line. You know, different publications are going to yeah, have different. But I, uh, and I and I never knew whether I was right or not, to be honest with you. Yeah. But I just saw, you know, it's my paper, so I did what I wanted. Was. Um, The uh, I, I wonder, you know, I know you you focused mainly on Niles, but then you had some other uh, community, you know, yeah. cities well, the, towns. Well, the, the neighboring town is Morton Grove. Okay. In fact, I lived there for a while. Okay. And uh, and then other towns, uh, Skokie is another one that's next to Niles. Okay. Des Plaines is next to Niles, and Park Ridge is next to Niles. Okay. What's well, um? And there were community newspapers in all of them. Did you take from pull from other papers, or did you do your own news, your own reporting? No, we did our own news. Do okay. Yeah. Because th that's one question I've always wondered about. Yeah. Um, oh, if we missed a story and they got a story, you know, I, I'd run it the next week. Uh huh. Yeah. But um, other than that, was it, you know there were uh, subsequent wars after, you know, you started. You know, after you came home from mm -hmm. from World War II, mm -hmm. um, how did I know you focused on community news? But mm -hmm. you know, were there there was there were people in the PR departments in the war yeah. who were sending press releases to probably to your yeah. newspaper? Yeah. How did you handle that um, or, or yeah. war coverage? Well, you know, run on the paper. Okay. Oh, absolutely. Well, did it? I mean, having been in the military and having seen you know the scenes of you know. A what? Uh, uh, having been in the military and having seen, yeah. you know, what, uh, uh, you know, parts of France and, and Belgium, Luxembourg, yeah. you know, Germany look like, was, I imagine your view of, uh, of what war is, you know, would have been impacted when you saw, when you heard about skirmishes or, or yeah. actual, you know, combat, yeah. you know, whether it was in Korea or um, yeah. Vietnam. I mean, how did that impact your, your coverage? Well, let's see. Get the wars mixed up. There was a Korean War. What was the other war to Korea? You remember? Was there uh, Vietnam? Was Vietnam right away? Uh, it might have been Vietnamese. But I had a young man that was working me, working for me. That um, I think he was the first soldier from Niles that went in service in Vietnam. Really? And he was first, and he was killed. Now that doesn't mean anything, but it just. Uh, yeah. But we were aware of it, and we used to write about him quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And he he didn't do much for the newspaper. 
fact, I think he might have been addressing the paper or something like that. Okay. Yeah. But, um, no, well, World War II and, and in Vietnam, there were two entirely different wars. But, um, um, I quite honestly, I, I don't remember, I, I knew hardly anybody that went to Vietnam, in the Vietnam War. And, I, and there were, there was still a couple million men, I think, were in it. Yeah. But uh, some, some great uh, journalists like um, Bill O'Reilly, do you know who Bill yeah. O'Reilly One of the truly great, great journalists, and Donald Trump, another great uh, um, warrior, and Rush Limbaugh, do you know who Rush yeah, Limbaugh? Yeah, right. Another great one. <laughs> Each one of them copped out and they never got in service sure, yeah. for some reason or other. Yeah. And Donald Trump, and I'm not trying to propagandize you, but Donald Trump um, talks all about uh, what's wrong with the United States and, and what we would do if, uh, when he gets to be president. But when he had a chance to be a soldier in the war, he said that he was he had some some something wrong with his back. He had some right. bone chips in his back. Yeah. And so he never went in service. Bill Bill O'Reilly never went in service. And he is forever talking about patriotism and <coughs> and Russ Limbaugh the same way. Yeah. <coughs> I no, no, that's that's okay. I, sh I shouldn't be talking about. That. Well, no, no, no. But I mean, like, you, but I, I think it is relevant. You're talking about your experience, your war experiences, yeah. how that that impacted your, you know, your views and in, in your life afterwards. Yeah, obviously. Yeah. Um, well, I, I know a few people that weren't in service. You know, and, you know, it was not my business that they weren't in service. And we had a friend of ours who, who didn't go in, and I, he was down. He was down in Illinois during the war. Nice guy. Yeah. He probably said he had some illness, or he might have had some, as far as I know. Yeah. But I, I never knew many fellows that were in the service. Was, did you, you know? Did you talk about service with uh, uh, with people who had been in the service yeah. outside of these clubs that you didn't join, um, that you didn't become a member of? I mean, well, I, I'm sure we did. You yeah. know, we talked about some of those, you know, some of the crazy things I told you. You know, like. Uh, um, oh, get, get, get losing my money in the, in, with the Barracks Bank. Oh, yeah, sure. sure. And um, there were a lot of crazy things. I um, I think I've told this story before. I, when I, I went in Paris, there was a famous guitarist who came from Belgium, very famous. And people know about guitarists are still there. I still know about them today. And he happened to be in this club in Paris. And I don't think I told you before. You, you, meant there, you mentioned it. Maybe I mentioned it. Yeah. But I went down to see him. And, uh, and there was a, a notice on the door that American soldiers were not allowed to go in there. And uh, I, I decided I wanted to see him. And they told me, and when I went in, they told me that. They said, the, the military, military police come in and they'll be looking for you. Right. And so I tell you what, I says, well, where's the, where the band going to be? And they said, they'll be over there. I says, well, I'll sit in back. And I did. I mean, they had the crazy stories, but those are stories you told. Yeah. And uh, the MPs came in, and they didn't see me or didn't care to see me, and they went back out again. I mean, I those kind of stories you, you told, you know. Sure, yeah. Um, let's see here, I'm trying to... I went into a, one one friend into one French place. I remember a bar. I think I might as well get this. And I was sitting at the bar. I think I said something about do you have any bourbon? No, you didn't tell me that story. Well, no, no, no. Do you have any bourbon? And they start laughing at me. It's during the war. They don't have any bourbon. <laughs> what did they have? The, was well, they, well, in the, France, well, the French wine. Drink, the French drink uh, brand, brandy. brandy. Okay, it's brandy. Yeah. What's what's the name of brandy? Was it like Armagnac or did they have a, yeah. like a there's another word, I can't remember the uh, name of it. Calvados. Calvados, too. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And when I, when I went up to the bar, and they started laughing at me. I said, bourbon. But then the people in the, that were sitting and standing at the bar, I noticed it, was, it isn't what they were exactly hostile, but they were very uh, unfriendly to me. I mean, I couldn't talk to anyone. Yeah. And, the, and then uh, 
And I, and I didn't stay. I went for about 15 minutes and I wanted to walk out. Right. Because I heard of, an awful lot of the French were friendly with the Germans during the war. Mm -hmm. And they might have been uh, just hostile to, to the Americans that were there. Right, right. And when, when they acted that way, I realized that, you know, they had a feeling that, uh, that, this, that, that there were no front of ours. Yeah. Um. Well, I'm sure that was a rarity. That didn't happen often. But, and those are the kind of stories you're told. Yeah, about, sure, you know. sure. Well, this, um. And, and then, you know, the, 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 the best story of all was, was, was the sergeant that married the, the German girl. That's fantastic. That's <laughs> that, a great that was story. A, that was a classic, really. <laughs> Did you, I mean, you, so you had introduced the sergeant to this woman, and then you didn't see him again until basically until you were, yeah, you know, how maybe many? four or five years later. Okay, in Champagne. Wow. Yeah. yeah. yeah just saw him there. Um, and he wasn't a typical college student either. He came from a, uh, from a background where I, I don't think uh, how college was a, a part of their lives, mm -hmm. really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, well, he was a very nice person. Yeah. Do you remember anything about the dinner that you went to with? Uh, I never went. Oh, you didn't go. No. Oh, okay. All right. Well, that's, um, well see. I wonder. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, any, anything? Uh, that maybe we, I know there's a lot that that we haven't addressed, but I wonder if there's anything that we have touched on that you'd like to. Um, what else? What else? What else? Did you have? Did you talk with Dr. with General uh, Lucius Clay? Did you did you meet him or did you see him at any point? No. Okay. I got I got in trouble once. So oh, I forgot to tell you this. I um I had a lady friend that came in to the house I was with. And the lady friend, when she left in the morning, um, I, <coughs> I told her I'd take her to where the, um, the subway station is. So I walked over to the subway station, but I, uh, I, I had on moccasins and sweat socks, and I wasn't dressed very properly. And in Berlin, um, the 82nd Airborne was a major uh, um, group in all during the war, a matter of fact, and they um, they dressed with white uh, scarves, and, uh, and their clothes were, were just immaculate, mm -hmm. and, as, and their helmets would be shining, and as a result, we we had to dress better than normally, so they were very careful that that we dressed properly also. But here I took this on way to the subway, and on the way back. I thought, gee, it's only 7 o'clock in the morning. I'll, I'll run over and, and, and eat breakfast before anybody gets up. Mm -hmm. So I ran over and had breakfast. And then it was, a, was about a block away from where I live, or two blocks away from where I live. And then when I um, got through with breakfast, I went outside and started walking back to where I lived. And I, was, and I passed a big building alongside of me that had an entrance on the west side of the building and the east side of the building. And I would be passing by the west side and going down toward the east side. Okay. But as I was walking, I saw coming at me three officers that were generals. Oh. And uh, as you'll find in a minute, um, I jumped, I went into the first entrance of the building and then I walked the length of the building inside. <laughs> and then when I walked out, I figured they'd be at the other end of the building. Right. So then I'd go home. Right. And I was right. Two of the three walked all the way to the other end of the building, and one waited at the door for me. <laughs> <laughs> so I got out. So I got out again. And he says, hey, you're the soldier that went in at that door, weren't you? And I said, yeah. So he says, well, you're out of uniform. You've got moccasins on, sweat socks on. What kind of an outfit is that? And I said, well, it was early in the morning. I didn't think anybody would be up. He says, do you know who that little soldier is down there? And I says, no, who is it? And he says, that's General Lucius Clay. 
He was in charge of all of Europe. Oh my gosh. Now, because I think I told you it was like anarchy there, because because they, they didn't know what they were doing. Nobody nobody had worked in an office before. Mm -hmm. But uh, when I when I uh, was there in the morning, sometimes we we would we would get out, but we would just stand at attention for about five minutes, and then we would leave for the day. Uh -huh. But this time there were about. I don't know, 25,000 American soldiers in Berlin at the time. And somebody read to me that as of Monday morning, all soldiers in Berlin will get up, up at, at 6.30 in the morning and march for 30 minutes. Hmm. So because of this soldier that you're looking at, okay. every soldier in Berlin had a march for 30 minutes. Oh my gosh. Because of, because of, because of me, they, they mentioned oh. some, some goofy guy yeah. goofed up and didn't do what he was supposed to do. <laughs> and so, all of, so all of the soldiers, and I never said a word to anybody but the, the fact that they knew it was me. Wow, yeah. That's I might not have lived. That's a story, yeah. <laughs> I, but then they kind of, they're probably silly kind of story. Yeah, you know, right, right. You know. The, th the stories that were, you know, much more serious, you didn't, you didn't mention them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You really, really did not too much. Right. Um. We used to, you're looking at something that's been silly in this last thing, it still, <laughs> is, still is. We used to uh, march through a town in France. And as you, we would march through the town, we would yell out at the people. Now, if you say, how are you in French, it's Right. So we would yell out, uh, uh, Komatali. Uh, we would say something that phonetically sounds like Komatali Vu. Okay. And we would say, let's hear about how your mule is, or something like that. <laughs> How's your mule? Yeah, I've got the French people that right. were standing there. Right. And we yell at them and say, go walk down the street. They didn't know we were goofing around. They would shake their heads and say, yeah. these, stupid, <laughs> these stupid American soldiers. And we told the silly stories we used to tell. Was it, you know, I mean, try to make light of it, yeah. you know, try to bring some humor yeah, into, sure. into a situation that's, you know, yeah. very difficult. Yeah, um, yeah, I, uh, it sounds like overall. But as a, as a war, and as, as I told you, I really was not a combat soldier, though yeah. I saw you know, when it's on the Rhine River, I, 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 I'm sure that was combat. But, yeah. but there was only 10% of the people that were in the war that were actually saw combat. Mm -hmm. Now, as, as I said, there were 16 million people in World War II. That means 16, 1,600,000. No, one, what's 10% of, <laughs> I can't even figure it out, of 16 million, uh, 16, uh, 16, is that 16? That's, something. Oh, that's, that's something. I'm terrible at math. You're asking a journalist to do math. I, mean, I think you're better at math than I am here. Um, let's see here. Million six hundred thousand? Let me do the calculator. I think so. 16 times 0 0.1. 1.6. You said 10%? Or yeah. 1%? Yeah, 10% 1.6 million? Yeah. Of 16 million? What did you say? No, 16 million. 16 million and 1% or 10%? 10%. Would be 1.6 million. Million, million. Yeah, yeah, 1.6 million. Yeah. yeah. So there was sure was a lot of people that did see combat. But um, and we, were in, we were in dangerous places, you know. I, we were in a hotel in Luxembourg for a couple of days, and there was gun shooting going off under my window. So what did you do with that? Did you just stay inside? I stayed inside. Yeah. I didn't even try to go out. Did you Did you look and see outside the window to see like what was it no, at night or I was got it? Away from the window. Was it at night or was yeah, it during the day? Okay. It was at night time. So this is, you know I mean obviously. Um, I just I just stayed away. And, you know it might have been our own soldiers that were shooting. 
I don't know. Was this at, was it before the the, the war had officially ended? It was during, it was during the war. Okay, but did, did things when you know the war ended in August '45? Yeah. Did things really just they just ceased at that time, or thing? And were there little skirmishes that continued afterwards? We we were not in any skirmishes with the, with the Germans. The okay. Outfit I was with. Okay. Okay. Um, but you knew, you must have known, you know, you, yeah. you still were keeping an eye out and... Oh, sure, you know. sure, sure. And I, I, was, I was telling my wife just the other day, I said, it was kind of foolish, I never realized it. But I used to go out some, at night time and walk in, a, in, a, in the city of Berlin, down the, down the streets where they were darkened or there were, there were lights on. And I would walk down the street by myself in my uniform not realizing that there were plenty of Germans that would probably take a, sh a shot at you. And I had never done it. I never done it. I never even thought about it. So you never felt out of, out of, out of ignorance? Out of ignorance more than anything else. Okay. Never I, I, said the, I said, you know, the war's over, nothing's going to happen. Yeah. But I'm sure there were plenty of people that, that would, if they could, they, they would have taken a shot at you. Yeah. yeah. Was, I mean, did you have any interactions with any individual um, Germans that were outside of the military? Um, you know, maybe going into a shop and purchasing something, or... No, no. We really didn't have much to do with the German civilians. Um, Berlin was all beat up. It was... It's hard to, hard to believe, but if you see a city like Chicago, and every building's been knocked down, yeah. it, it's, there, just, there just wasn't any civilian activity like there is today. You know, there was a few stores that were open, but very few stores. Were people in line when there were, you know, uh, vendors, you know, food vendors, yeah. people in line to get uh, what was, I guess, rations? At the, it must have been rations oh, there yeah, after the yeah, war. Yeah. Um, was it most? Was it women in line, or was it men too in line? Or well, we don't see women with children. You would see women with children. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I'm sorry, I can't give you anything more accurate. No, that's okay. That's okay. Um, you've answered a lot of questions. Um, well, you asked a lot of questions. <laughs> yeah. For me, this is a, a wonderful opportunity, and I really appreciate well, thank it. You. Again, you you coming were, in. You were very good, Diane. Very good. Thanks, Mr. Bresser. I, I really what appreciate do you do, it. What do you do back home? Um, I'm going to turn this off. Um, yeah, okay. Um, I, um, it was probably the best editorial person I ever had. And her husband was a doctor, and um, he passed away at a very early age. And she lives across the street from me. She came in one time and asked for a job. And she was very good. She loved to write. And uh, she was a very good reporter. As opposed to, I had a girl that worked for me that went to the University of Missouri. And that was, they have a very fine journalism school, I've been right. told. Yeah. Yeah. And she was the worst journalist I ever had. Oh, really? She wouldn't write details. She, and she'd be writing about a budget or something, and say this this organization went over a million dollars, but she never ever mentioned about what their budget was prior to that. Oh, really? Okay. And I couldn't believe it. And a couple times I told her that, and she thought I was crazy. Uh, she says, "What?" Well, she says, "That's not what the story is." And it sure is. Yeah. I says you have to know the background as well as right. what you're writing. Right, sure. You know, and she and she, uh, you know, she graduated from Missouri Journalism School. This, yeah, that attention to detail, I think, is so important, and knowing, you know, kind oh, of yeah. asking the questions before, current, and then afterwards, you know, yeah. to see that that Absolute, change. Absolutely. Yeah. Are you and I through? Oh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. It's, it's been it's been long. Well, listen, Joy, thank you. Thank you. No, thank it's you so much. Good, uh, Nice of you to ask me to do this. I'm not quite, I don't quite understand what, what's the relationship with uh, this Pritzker uh, military, do you know?